The Seventh Tower by Garth Nix. Book One, The Fall. Chapter 20. All too soon, the sleigh left the circle of light cast by the ice carl's great sunstone. Once again, Tao felt the fear of darkness, and his hand crept to the newly mended chain around his neck. But there were two of the pale green moth lamps on the sleigh, and the Ruska's antlers, as the spiky branches on their heads were called, also glowed with faint luminescence. Mila noticed Tao reach for his sunstone, and he saw her smile. Slowly, he forced himself to let go of the chain. He didn't want to let her know he was afraid. They drove on in silence for an hour or more, and Tao soon found that Mila was at least partly right. He found the speed of the sleigh exciting at first, but after a while, standing up as it bounced and swayed over the lumpy ice made his knees sore, and his fingers were aching from holding on to the side. Not being able to see properly where they were going also made him nervous, though Mila did not seem concerned. Either she could see a lot better than he could in the dim light of the lanterns, or the Ruska could, and she trusted them. After another hour, Tao was nearly fainting from weariness. He had slumped down, no longer trying to match Mila's upright stance. His shadow garb was the only thing propping him up, though it didn't dare do too much, since it had been told to behave like a natural shadow in order to placate the ice carls. Will we stop soon? Tal asked finally, when his weariness overcame his pride. Yes, said Mila. We have nearly come to the living sea, by my reckoning. We should see the Selsky. Yes, there is the globe. She pointed, at the same time hauling back on the reins to slow the Reska down. Tal looked where she indicated. At first he couldn't see anything, but as they drew closer he saw that the ice slanted gently down in front of them. Off in the distance, and a little below them, there was a dull glow that seemed to cover all the horizon ahead. "'What is that light?' he asked. Kalakoi, said Mila, making a circle with her thumb and forefinger. "'They are small things, about so big, that grow on the Selski. They glow and bring moths and the sleeping ash that the Selski eat. But the Kalakoi also eat the Selski when they grow old and do not scrape enough of them off.' Um, what are the slurpinish? It grated on Tal that, as a chosen, he had to ask these questions of a natural, but it was important to know. Sleepinesh, corrected Mila. They go in front of the Selski always. They swarm in uncountable numbers, more even than the Selski. The sleepinesh come up through the ice, and if the Selski do not eat them, they go back through it into the water below. Some say that these survivors change into something else in the deep water, and birth new sleepinesh. I do not know if this is true. What do they look like? asked Tal nervously. He didn't like the sound of things that bore through the ice in uncountable numbers. Like the string of a harp, but you never see just one, said Mila. She seemed to struggle with her desire to treat Tal like dirt, and an equal desire to show off her knowledge. Showing off one. They royal together, more in a single pace square than snowflakes in a storm. They are not dangerous, but when they first come to the ice, they weaken it. That is why we never cross between the different hordes of the living sea, but only in the temporary gaps. There is always open water, where Selsky and Sleepinesh first meet. Tal was silent for a while, digesting this information. The sleigh continued more slowly, heading down the slope in the ice. The glow grew brighter. Tao watched it nervously, understanding more about what the ice carls meant when they called the Selsky migration path the Living Sea. Certainly the light of their passage seemed to fill all the world ahead. Suddenly, Mila pulled hard on the reins and called out the names of the two leaders. Tada! Ral! The Reska came to a sliding, ice-shard scattering halt. Mila pulled a spear out of the scabbard, choosing the one with the largest head, a wickedly pointed piece of bone as wide and long as Tao's arm. What is it? asked Tal, as he pulled out his sunstone and raised it. All he could see was the glow in the distance. But as the Reska stopped snorting, he heard a dull rumble as well, a sound like many distant drums, low, loud, and continuous. Rogue Selsky, snapped Mila. She jumped down onto the ice and lifted her face mask to see better. Broken off from the horde, we have to push it back in. Tal peered into the distance. There was something there, dark upon the ice. He'd taken it for a small hillock or mound of some kind. Now he realized it was moving, heading toward them. That's a Selsky? 
he asked in amazement. It had to be a hundred stretches long and twenty high. It was almost as big as the ice carl's ship, a great hulking black mass covered in glowing spots that made a pattern like the star-filled night above the veil. It was lifting itself up on its huge forelegs, or four flippers, and then leaping and sliding forward. It was close enough now for Tal to hear the ice crack and shatter every time it came down. The sleigh shivered under his feet. Can't we just leave it alone? No, said Mila. Rogues are a danger to the ship and other clans. It must be turned back to the horde. He won't be able to do anything to it with that. Tal nodded at her spear. The girl was even madder than he thought. Nothing could possibly turn that huge monster. A fool harpoon would be better, Mila agreed, in the same sort of tone a chosen performer might use to describe an achievement that was not quite worthy of the indigo ray of extreme approval. She drew her knife, another sharpened curved bone, and added, I will have to climb up between leaps and blind it in the left eye. That will make it turn aside. No! Tal exclaimed. He couldn't get back to the castle without Mila. She might be a dangerous lunatic, but he couldn't afford to lose her. At least not yet. What about our quest? That has to be more important, doesn't it? Mila hesitated. For the first time, Tal saw her as a girl his own age. She looked like his friends at the lectorium when they were asked a question they couldn't answer. Then the familiar control came back, and her face settled into its stern pattern. You are correct, said Mila, with obvious reluctance. She returned knife and spear to their scabbards, lowered her face mask, and jumped back on the sleigh. The quest is of the first importance. The foreguard will take care of the rogue. Tal breathed a sigh of relief and slipped his sunstone back under his furs. Mila whipped the reska up again and the sleigh moved off, turning a little to pass behind the rogue Selski. You do not need to be afraid, Mila said as they came closer. She had seen Tal shiver as ice chips blew across them from the Selski's strange leaping progress. The Selski never turned back. They will change direction to one side, but never back. A bit like an ice curl, Tal thought. He peered at Mila through the amber eyepieces of his mask. She was obviously very brave. Climbing that Selski would have meant her own death for certain, but Tal knew she would have done it if he hadn't given her a good reason not to. He was reluctant to admit it, but he couldn't think of many chosen who would die for their order. Of course, they lived in a much more civilized way. Mila was prepared to change direction when she had to, Tal thought, and the danger of the Selski was over. Or was it? As the sleigh continued on, Tal noticed that the continuous drumming sound was getting louder. Much, much louder. And the glow that filled the ice and sky was brighter and closer. Tal could see more huge shapes, too, leaping and sliding. Lots and lots of them. He was just about to say something when Mila suddenly cracked her whip and shouted. The rescue broke into an even faster gait. The sleigh picked up speed. Tal stared at the ice in front of him, willing it to be clearer than it was. To his left, he could see a solid wall of Selski traveling away from them. To his right, there was an enormous mass of Selski sliding and leaping toward them, an almost solid wall of strangely glowing flesh, preceded by a rolling wave of ice and snow. The drumming sound was now a bass roar that drowned all other sounds. They had begun to cross the living sea of the Selski but it didn't look like the right place or the right time to tell. The onrushing Selski were too close, and the gap between the two parts of the horde was closing. We must take shelter at the rock! Mila screamed, her words fighting against the noise of the Selski. She pointed to a dark mass ahead that Tal had thought was another Selski. He hadn't noticed that it wasn't moving. He didn't think they could make it.